And now, coming live from the Midwest Racks and Rod Studio, it's the Outdoors Show with your host, a man who is clever, witty. I could go on and on, but I'm having a hard time reading his handwriting. Scott Biscoping. <laughs> Andrew, I'm sober enough to know what I'm doing, but drunk enough to really enjoy doing it. Biscoping. With special in studio guest, Aaron Big Alki. And today's episode is brought to you by ETA Solutions. We've got it. I just hit my head on the mic. <laughs> <laughs> that's a way to start it out all right guys welcome back to another episode of the midwest racks and rods outdoor show like you just heard i'm something something scott biscobing and something something clever and witty but <laughs> yeah you gotta write write a little better i don't know oh yeah it's <laughs> writing his own intros now folks yeah right all right guys thanks again for joining us uh this is season three episode two um, we've been kind of behind the eight ball here a little bit with getting some shows out, um, just life. We've had turkey season for the last several weeks, and I was in Ohio last weekend. It's just it's trying to get uh, shows together is, is a forever constant challenge. But we are very fortunate that uh, we are joined here today by Aaron Begelke from Begelke Outdoor Enterprises, and uh, we really appreciate you coming here today on this beautiful Sunday afternoon here. Or, um, probably the last place anybody really wants to be, myself included. Let's sit in a studio. <laughs> Down in the dungeon here. <laughs> but, uh, no, we, we really appreciate you coming out here today and uh, joining us. Absolutely. It's actually kind of a nice little break. We've been uh, going pretty constant here with planting and getting seeds and everything out, so opportunity to come sit down and talk and and take a little bit of a break is is welcome yeah absolutely and i mean yesterday in new lisbon wisconsin you you and grandpa ray outdoors yep john uh, Brian. yep yep john um you guys had deer school 2022 right we did we uh try and do a couple events a year um deer school uh was at uh, my place this year uh we did um talked about a lot of things about uh, sprayer calibrations and and options for fertilizers. Obviously, the market this year, everybody knows fertilizer prices are through the roof. Mm -hmm. um, anytime you can get uh, John in a room with a group of people uh, and we all get to share our knowledge, it ends up being a really good event. And we had people from northern Minnesota and, and all over Wisconsin and the Midwest. So it was a great, great uh, time to spend together. Sure. Um, if you can talk maybe a little bit more about about that so for for those of you who aren't familiar you guys it wasn't just yourself it was john right john was there yep john was there um i i own bugalke outdoor enterprises we're a full service uh land management company we sell um tree stands uh, uh trail cameras we do custom planting and uh john o'brien owns grandpa ray's outdoors who through the years of me looking for a food plot company that I wanted to trust and be a part of, um, I found John, and that was the beginning of our partnership. Sure. How, and how long has that been now? Uh, we've, I've been with John for three years planting his products and on board um, actually as a partner for a couple of years now. Oh, okay. Great. Um. So in this deer school, what what are all the different things you guys cover there? I mean, is that like an all day event? Is it? It was supposed to be four hours, and ended up <laughs> we were there for six. Um, <laughs> but uh, we we actually had a spray company um, bring some products out. Uh, one of the main issues that guys get scared away from sprayers is the calibration part of the sprayer. How do I know how many gallons of water am I supposed to be spraying? So we actually had that company come out, take us through a calibration. Um, from there, we jumped into, you know, a little bit of um, food plot science, a little bit of soil health. Um, we really focus on on using the soil as our tool to create better nutrient dense products for the deer to eat. Okay. Um, so we shared some secrets through the guys that were there. Uh, we actually did a land tour, went out and looked at a couple of the 
um, plots that we have out there. We spent some time in our test plot and uh, then went out to a couple of my hunting locations and took them around and and uh, got everybody a little bit uh, soil on their boots uh, experience out there. Sure. Um, your background, do you have a long-standing background in in food plots and land? I have a long-standing background in the outdoors. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> is where I am. Sure. And, uh, you know, my family has been involved in the outdoor industry since I can remember when I was in high school back in the late 80s, early 90s, um, my student teaching, or not student teaching, my student work was working in my uncle's gunsmith shop, uh, working on stocks, and my brother owned the archery shop in town, so I was spooling reels and fletching arrows, and um, sure. from there, I kind of, I went on a wild journey. I spent a couple years uh, in college, ended up moving out to Wyoming, got hired on as a uh, mule deer and elk guide Oh, okay. Uh, out of uh, Cody, Wyoming for a couple years. And when I come back from there, uh, I, j- I, I took an interesting path where I worked construction for a couple of years, got into the automotive business, and worked my way up through the ranks with a major insurance company and spent almost two decades in the corporate life. Okay. And uh, Sorry, I'm having a hard time picturing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, um, it, it, you know, it, the money was great but it, it just wasn't feeling a passion. We were smart, and I was able to sock some money away and uh, uh, have a very understanding wife that allowed me through a year-long process to convince her that I could give up my job and pursue my passion full-time. So. Okay, sure. Oh, that's awesome. Hey, you know, and, and, and to touch on that, I think uh, anybody that spends any amount of times outdoor, any amount of time outdoors – you know, we owe a lot to our wives. <laughs> yeah, well, Amen. Get up there. <laughs> yeah. It's true. True story. <laughs> um, so your connection with uh, John O'Brien from Grandpa Ray's, how, how did you say that started? Well, I was probably what I would consider with the knowledge that I have now, the world's worst food plotter uh, when I first started out. Um, I was the guy. I don't know. I don't know. I, got, I could challenge you, maybe. Right. Um, I did everything possible that I could do wrong. Um, I was deep tilling everything. I was spraying nasty herbicides on everything. And uh, I was buying the buck on the bag seeds, not having any knowledge of what was going on. And I started, I, I work a lot off of observation, and I, when I start doing something, I really get involved in it, and I started reading tags, and I was picking some of these seed tags, uh, looking at these seed tags that I was seeing, and there were certain things on there that I had questions about. You know, you're, you're buying a four-pound bag of seed that's telling me it's 50% inert matter, and I look up what an inert matter is, and it's nothing. It, 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 you're not buying seed. I knew there was a little gamemanship going on in the industry. Sure. And uh, so I kept looking. I, I had relationships with a couple different seed companies, but there was always little things that, um, I guess, no better term than rubbed me the wrong way. And I found John's seed, and I actually, before I even met him, I bought his seed on his label. And uh, every experience that I had from John there out, just strengthened the fact to me that this was the guy that that I needed to be working with. Okay. Um, and then once we got the relationship, and it just seems like every time I learn something new about this guy, it's like, yep, this is the company that I need, need to uh, be using and be a part of. And, uh, you know, I kind of liken it to, you know, you got a toothache. Are you going to go to a car dealer for it? <laughs> or... <laughs> If your car engine's broken, you're going to go see a doctor for it. And there's a lot of people out there that have marketing degrees, business degrees that are peddling seed. And to me, I should be buying it from an agronomist, somebody that knows what's going on. So so to that point, what, what separates his seed 
versus you know what you were talking earlier. That well, a couple of things that have come up. Um, I'm just gonna real quick. I don't mean. Yep. No problem. This um, one of the couple of things that really co- that came up was uh, when I was riding around with him once. We swung, swung into a dealer that sold his seed, and I'm like, "Well, what are we doing here? It's kind of the end of season, you know." And he says, "Yeah, I'm grabbing my seed." And I says, "Well, what do you mean you're grabbing your seed?" He says, "I'm taking it off the shelf." I'm not going to sell year old seed to the public. So, okay. that, and that was just another check in the box. This guy knows what he's doing. Yeah. yeah. And um, so quality is important. Yeah. He goes around and he pulls all his seed off all his dealer shelves every year to guarantee that um, year old seed is not being sold on the market. Uh, another experience I had with him is uh, this year he took me to a conference. It was the White Hills of Wisconsin. Uh, deer farmer convention. Okay. And as I learned, um, John has, it consults and has been hired with a lot of these deer farmers and helps them to grow the biggest deer in North America. Oh, wow. So okay. it's like, okay, check the box, check the box, check the box, check the box. Um, so everything about uh, him and the way he runs his business, the quality of the seeds, it just it it every time I was solidified that that was the right you know the right thing to be um, there, and the guy is a complete wealth of knowledge. I mean, he's just he's on a level um, with with the the soil and the seeds and growing and the forages where we can be walking through a food plot and he'll look around and he'll see what weeds are growing out there and he'll be like, yeah, the soil test on this one is going to be X Y Z, and I'm like. Okay. Well, what are you talking yeah, about? He's going to know what the pH level it, and everything it, he is. can because certain weeds that grow prefer, sure. you know, they're all there's something lacking there, and he can just look at that and it's like, so that kind of got me into the start of the education and learning, and I I really took a deep dive into that, and I follow guys like Grant or uh, not Grant, um, Gabe Brown, who's a regenerative agriculturist, okay, uh, Ray Archuleta, soil scientist, and I'm currently studying under um, Dr. Elaine Ingham, who's uh, when I get done with this course, I'm going to be certified to do soil analysis on the microbial life in it. And that's kind of the way that we look at things. We build everything from the soil up, and we're just striving for that nutrient-dense food. Yeah. So that, you said it's a, a course that you're currently taking. How yep. long, you know, is something that... that uh, what, what kind of time requirement are you looking at there? Uh, it's, it's 64 two-hour long lectures. So I, I've yet to start it. <laughs> <laughs> I am enrolled, but I also coach high school track and field. Okay. And we're in our last two weeks, two, three weeks here. So I'm like, you know what? Let's get through season. Yeah. And yeah. then I'm going to take a deep dive into that, and that'll be my uh, summer project. 64 two-hour courses, my God. <laughs> yeah. And that's not including the lab time and all that stuff. Sure. Wow. Okay. Yeah, it'll be it'll be detailed, but I'm really, you know, the more I learn about um, the, the processes in the soil and how agriculture practices have really, I mean, there's no better way to explain it, ruined our soil, that stuff starts to make sense. And then I see the results in the deer that we grow, um, I see the results when the properties that I manage have the deer and their neighbors don't. And, you know, it's all about, you know, the preferred forage. And if you want the preferred forage, it's the most nutrient dense and most palatable. So. I don't, I just want to backtrack real quick. Yep. There's something you said just a little while ago about pulling the year old seed off. Um, what exactly happens to the seed? I mean, I've, obviously there must be a shelf life. Yeah. And, what is that shelf life? Well, it, the shelf life differs from seed to seed. Okay. Um, so, you know, and depending on how it was stored and this and that. But every bag on the label has a germination percentage. And as time goes by, that germination percentage starts to creep down. Sure. So you'll have some seed companies in the industry. What they do is they print another seed lo- label they drop the germination percentage and send that out in the mail and have them relabel the seed. I, that's funny you say that because I knew exactly what you were talking about the second you started saying that because I've seen it. Oh, yeah. So there's like a sticker. It's a label. Yep, right over it's the like top. It's like it's, and I've never pulled it off. 
you know, and it would be interesting to see if I actually pull it off and you could see the original printing on the packaging to see exactly what, you know, right. what it was and what it is now. But yeah, I think that's something probably 90% of guys going out there planting plots, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe less, but don't even realize that, that that's a yeah. thing. <laughs> the three, the right three here. biggest things that I tell people, um, when, when, well, four. Number one, is there a picture of a big buck on the front of the bag? Then walk, <laughs> then walk by it. Then you don't need that bag. But the three main things. We're not going to name any names. <laughs> the, the, yeah. The, the three biggest things is you want to look at the percentage of inert matter, which is basically a seed coat. It's a covering, but it adds to the weight. So if you're buying four pounds of seed, that's 50% inert matter. Then you're getting two pounds of seed versus a four pound bag with no inert matter. Sure. So you're you may pay three dollars more, but you're getting twice as much seed in that other bag. On something like that, uh, like a uh, food plot, right? Yep. Versus a seeding my lawn. Okay. Is overseeding a thing then when it comes to a food plot? Can you overseed? Is absolutely. It... Okay. I'm I am spreading seed damn near twelve months a year. Okay. Um, you know. Obviously, now we're full tilt into uh, warm season plantings throughout the summer. If I'm seeing some issues pop up someplace, I'm interceding. Fall, I'm interceding into my uh, grains, my corn, my bean, my um, milo, whatever I've got going on there. Uh, then throughout season, you know, the, you find little things where you want to stick some seed, and then you're right into frost seeding, and you start all over again. So I'm rolling seed every month of the year. Maybe not November unless I'm up in my rut stand throwing some seed, sunflower seeds out, out of my mouth or something. So frost seeding. I was just going to say, go <laughs> ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Because let's, let's, let's just dumb it down here real okay. quick. Yeah. Um, for Joe Average, um, that is maybe just getting into it. Because I'm actually a part of several pages uh, mm -hmm. on Facebook and, and on social media dedicated to food plots and stuff. And... To me, like having some somebody who's planted some in the past, um, it's a little overwhelming. You sure. know, when some of the technical terminology that people use, I mean, obviously I know what frost seeding is, but let's just take it back here. Let's let's start, you know, if we were going to say this is, uh, you know, 101. Sure. All right, so frost seeding. Yep. Okay, you know, to, to start it out, um, my process and the process that I that I truly believe is the best process includes minimum tillage of the soil. It includes minimum use of herbicides, keeping a living root in the ground as long as possible, and always having the ground covered. So if we're not tilling the soil, how are we incorporating them seeds? Well, Mother Nature's been incorporating seeds for tens of thousands of years. Right. You have uh, prairies and, and yep. that, and the seeds, milkweed, you know, the seeds, yep. they and they just land. They land on things. A, a, a certain percentage of them are going to take, and some are not. Yep. And what happens is uh, frost seeding, you're putting down the seed, and you can even do it right on top of a little bit of snow at the end of the year. And as the temperatures warm up and then freeze at night, there's an expansion and a contraction of the ground. Okay. So it's opening up and cracking, shrinking, opening up and cracking, shrinking. Well, what's happening is these seeds are getting incorporated into that well, as that process is happening. Getting to that level that yep. they need to be getting at. Getting to that level that they need to be at. Unbelievable, great method for um, minimum, I mean, minimum work, minimum effort in getting uh, a great food plot. So that's like nature's way of exactly one hundred percent, so to speak. And honestly, that's what we need to get back to is we need to get back to nature's way and away from agriculture practices because the agriculture practices are what's actually harming our environment and harming our soils and producing very low nutrient dense food. All right, um, I know that's not one hundred and one, but <laughs> explain. Well, okay, if, if you think of a farmer. Um, you know, spring comes and you got this bare field that's got a little bit of soybean residue, a little bit of corn residue on it. Or so whatever. a, a pre-existing yeah, agricultural yep. we're, field. We're, going to, we're just following through with the next year's planting. So that was completely bare. Yeah. After harvest, that field just sat bare. Um, it wasn't collecting any carbon. 
all the carbon that was in that soils now in the atmosphere. So, you, you know, we, we talk about the increasing carbon, uh, the effects on weather changes. Um, you know, the soil holds more carbon than living tissue in the atmosphere combined. But if you drive from here to southern Kansas, right now, all you're going to see are hundreds of thousands and millions of acres of bare ground. That's dead. There's nothing living there. There's no carbon in the soil. There's very little organic matter. So they're going to plant a seed, and that seed's going to start growing, and then there's going to be some other stuff that's going to come up. And what are they going to do? They're going to come through with a spray, and they're going to kill everything except for that one thing that they want. Okay. Then they've taken some nutrients out of the soil. By killing everything else off. Well, when they harvest or oh, yeah. to, to grow their plant, grow, yeah. their, their, their crop has, has mine nutrients from the soil. Sure. Now they're going to come in with a harvester and they're going to harvest the crop, which is the nutrients and take it away from the land mm-hmm. and go sell it. So they've given nothing back to the soil other than their amendments which is another topic that we could get deeper into later. Maybe we'll do a... Um, uh, <laughs> just going to go ahead and write that we'll do, down. We'll do the advanced episode. Right. Um, and it's it, it's just years and years and years of abuse. Now, whose fault is it? It's really nobody's fault. Because when that farmer pulls into that co-op to sell his crop, did they pay him on the nutrient density of that corn? No. no. Did they pay him on the... The how it tastes? No, they pay them on how much did you get. Right. So what we have, if we have a natural agriculture system that through the years, through the use of uh, unnatural amendments and herbicides and all this stuff that we're putting on it, we've turned basically into a, a manufacturing facility. Mm-hmm. There's very little to no microbial life in the soil. There's very little to no organic matter left in the soil. And if you think back to when the, the buffalo roamed the prairies and, or a forest that you're walking through, how much fertilizer are we spreading in those scenarios? None. Because sure. nature was taking care of its own stuff. But as soon as we come in as humans and decide we're going to start running this manufacturing process versus working with nature, you get involved in this loop of you have to use the amendments and you have to use the chemicals and you have to keep doing this because you've you've killed the soil and it's no longer naturally able to take care of itself and have plants thrive. It's it's really quite fascinating. You know, uh, from from a layman Mm -hmm. perspective, it's something certainly I've never really considered or or taken and, you know, we struggled with, with food plots and, uh, you know, for, for years and years and then kind of just started developing other ways um, of getting deer, right? Sure. So what... Before, I know where you're going. You know where I'm I going. I know where you're going with that, but before I get in, before you get into that, keep that. Hold that oh, thought. I got oh, hold that thought. I'm holding it. <laughs> um, so when we talk about, when you were talking about, like, barren fields and that we when we see that right nothing else is growing up in there like right. when it's when it's off season and that it is just dirt another it good is point. literally dirt now when you're doing a food plot or something like that in your own property it's like a constant battle of all the other things weeds now i do understand that like because one of the mistakes i made early on was over tilling mm-hmm. so i tell me if i'm correct here in saying this that when you're tilling up a, a, a piece of of your property there, and let's say it's it's somewhat prairie like, so I've got like this this area, or we have this area on one of our properties that's kind of this big open field. It's surrounded by pines, and I would say it's maybe what five six acres. Yeah, in that. G- yeah, about that. And uh, that's a spot that I started doing some smaller. Uh, quarter acre plots sure. on different sides of that um is somewhat like kill plots yep. so to speak um and the weeds so over tilling you're bringing up dormant seed Correct. from those weeds yep. because it was like 
it went from like, oh, okay, well, it's kind of prairie-ish. There's some wildflowers. There's some weeds. There's some milkweed popping up here and there. And then from that, like, in the area that I tilled, like, just turned into, like, a weed field. Yeah, exactly. And, that, and that's, what it, that's what you're doing. 100%. So over-tilling. Yep. Right? You had mentioned, I think you used that word, over-tilling, or, or deep-tilling. Yeah, um, the key to success, and and I'm I'm not a hundred percent no till because there's situations where that you know it's not possible, but in in the food plot bible you you reduce the amount of tillage as much as you can, because not only when you till soil, soil soil is a living body filled with aggregates and micronutrients and and macronutrients and and all this life, there's more life under the surface of the earth than sure. there is above the surface. Yeah, of the sure. Earth. As soon as we it's dis- just micro, yeah, and as soon as we disrupt that s- system, w- it would be like somebody coming through with with a huge, um, oh, unbelievably huge lawnmower and mowing a city down. You know, we we've just destroyed that environment that they thrive in, and we've killed the soil. And once you once you disrupt that system, now you've started the process. Okay, now I have to become the process. And unfortunately, the way that we become that process is with um, manufactured fertilizers and herbicides, which, get you know, yeah, they serve the purpose, but they also are harmful to the so- soil life and the organisms and everything that's going when on. Are you talking like when, when somebody's using like a kills all or Roundup or anything? Yeah, or, I would or, say that glyphosate is definitely, um, Roundup is definitely one of the worst processes. The way that Roundup actually works is just, is it does the same thing to the micronutrient or to the micro life and the microorganisms that it does to the plant. It disrupts it. You're also killing the the food for the microorganisms, and you break that symbiosis that the microorganisms have with the plants. And you talked about weeds, and you know we call them weeds. Mother Nature calls them band aids, because the one thing that Mother Nature hates is bare ground. She cannot stand bare ground. Sure. So bare ground shows up, and Mother Nature's going to have a specific plant that we would call weed that will thrive in that condition to take it to the next level to eventually get it back to where it needs to be. And we come in and we say there's weeds, let's kill them, let's be done. Well, we need to get back to let's not create the situation that the weeds have to show up in the first place. Right, so you don't have that bare ground right now. So yeah, till, without without destroying those the nutrients and everything that's in the soil there right. to begin with, and that's essentially what like big manufacturing farming right yeah is, it is, is doing. I mean, it, it totally you, is. It, that soil has been conditioned for one thing and one thing only, or maybe two things. Maybe two. Maybe they got a like two crop soy, rotation. Right, yeah. a two crop rotation. You look at a guy like Gabe Brown, who's he's out in Bismarck, North Dakota. He's got a forty thousand acre ranch out there. Um, he does very little tilling. He does not use herbicides or fertilizers anymore on most of his ground. And he gets paid exorbitant amount of money for his chicken eggs, his crops, his chicken. Because when you have an animal that's eating nutrient dense food, the byproducts of that animal, eggs, meat, milk, whatever, is going to be more nutrient dense than for us to consume. Okay. If you would look at a a cob of sweet corn that was grown back in 1930, and a cob of sweet corn that uh, was grown last year, and you sent that to the lab, you would find out that the nutrient density would blow your mind of how much we've lost over the years. And then you look at the health of the human population, and that's a big part of it. And part of our issue is. We're still consuming the same amount of food, but we're not getting the nutrients out of it. Yeah. And we get sick because of it. And our guts are just like the soil. It's full of microorganisms. Right. And it's and, and the reasons for like probiotic. Yeah, and exactly. That, you know, you 100%. need that. You need the good stuff in your yep. guts. 
So you take that a step further then, and I know we're, you know, we're talking food plots and we're talking deer. And a deer, you know, can only eat so much. So we want to pack as much nutrients in that bite of food as we can so that he's as healthy and, and, and as quality an animal as we can possibly get. And, you know, you, you get an egg field of really low uh, nutrient dense food that that deer's feeding up on or filling up on, you're not doing them any favors. You're putting them behind the eight ball already. You know, one of the things that I always cringe about in the fall, you always see these pictures of these guys holding up these these turnips and that are huge or these radishes that are, you know, three foot long. And I actually cringe a little bit from that because I don't want my deer eating a, a, a radish that big or a turnip that big because there's no nutrients <laughs> Like in little there. baby basketballs. Yeah. <laughs> and, on top, you know, he's going to fill his stomach and get very little nutrients out of it. It, that is, it, it's it's an interesting point to me because, uh, you know, years ago, I didn't view a food plot like that, right? No, I, I viewed I. A, a food plot more of a an attractant, right? right? Let, let's get the deer onto the property, but yep, exactly, I think that's I think that's for the most part what why people plant them. It's like it, you know, it. it this is my way of putting a pile of corn out there legally. Right. You know, it's, okay. you're doing it as an Let's attractive. take that point. You own the property next to me, and I have a four-acre food plot, and you have a four-acre food plot. And I plant my way. I create life in the soil. I do minimum tillage. I don't use herbicides. And you do the agricultural practice, and you're tilling your soil and spraying right. it off. And that deer's hungry. Where's he going to be? He's going to hit yours. Exactly. 100%. <laughs> Which might explain why our food plots didn't, uh, you know, produce like it, like we had thought it would. Right. Right. Sure. sure. Um, I mean, nutrient density equals higher protein levels, higher micronutrient level, levels, higher sugar levels, higher starch levels, which all go into palatability. Have you ever, um, you know, been someplace and there's a farmer's market stand and you swing it and you buy a carrot or you buy something and you take it home and you take a bite of it and you're like, you're just blown away by the taste. And you're like, wow, this is unbelievable compared to the package I bought at this is Walmart. What is, this is what carrots are supposed to do. They're this is what I remember them tasting like when I was a kid. Exactly. And that's, <laughs> that's what it is. It's the nutrient density of the product, which directly correlates with palatability. That's so 100%. funny. 100%. Absolutely. And, and so... Uh, a good friend of mine, uh, just the other night we were talking about this, and we were talking about it's somewhat, it, it's related but unrelated at the same time. We were talking about my four-year-old being somewhat of a picky eater but liking certain foods, and then especially vegetables. Like he loves vegetables and fruits and stuff. And we were talking specifically about carrots. And my, my friend, you know, Scott, um, he's like, well, yeah, so his son really likes it too, and he goes to this one – organic stand you know it's it's local and then he brings these carrots home this kid just mows them down yep. and that and just loves them you go and buy store-bought carrots like in the bag you know yeah. like little mini carrots and stuff and it's just which like, are just adult carrots that, that just ta honestly tastes like water that were probably there's no, rotten so right. <laughs> there's no sweetness to them yeah exactly. there, it's just it like is this really a carrot right you there's know nothing like, to it right and then you get a you go somewhere local organic you know and it's a night and day difference. Um, I didn't mean to cut you off no. there. I just, cause we could go on and on and we, we will continue on here, but there's so many things I want to cover here and I, we're definitely going to have to do another show for sure. Um, beyond this, but I want to bring it back, dial it back to the one Oh one to the one Oh ones here. And as a matter of fact, let's just go here real quick to Chris. Um, Chris, our, our former co hit, co-host here still part of our team here he asked a question he says i currently have a two acre uh hay field that i want to plant some type of deer magnet food for fall what should i do to the current crop hay and how do i transition the land to become my food plot do i till it and wait a year or should i immediately throw some type of food plot seed also i want to be able to start doing anything 
I, I won't be able to start doing anything until late summer. Sure. Now, I'm going to, you know, I'm not on this plot. So when he says, hey, that could mean a lot of different things to me. It could be a mix of uh, some red clovers and alfalfa. It could be this. Sure. But generally speaking. Chris, if you're listening, you can chime in and get, there, there give us go. a little more detail. Generally speaking, if it is a hay field, it does have some um, positive uh, attributes right now. So I would leave it. I would let it go. There's two things he can do to the existing existing plot until fall comes. And they're two very important things. The first one is be clipping. He needs to go in throughout the summer. And, and if they're harvesting the hay, that's a different story. No, this is just his. Okay. This is his private property that he just bought. Perfect. Uh, like I mentioned, he had moved up there. And they had, so they had horses. Gotcha. Perfect. The previous okay, owners. so it, it probably is a Timothy mix with some clover. So sure. there's nutrition value there. I wouldn't do anything with what, what he currently has other than I'd go in there every three to four weeks and I'd clip it. When I say clip it, that's mowing, but we're only mowing at 50% of the height. So if it's a foot tall, you're taking six inches off. If it's eight inches, you're taking four inches off. Excuse me. What that's going to do is it's going to... It's going to encourage that um, plant to start some new growth, which is going to be the most nutritious, most attractable stuff. The other thing it's going to do is it's going to make sure that if there are some clovers in there that we're thinking about going into reproduction mode, that we're stopping that process. Because the last thing we want to do is stop that reproduction process. Because as soon as that starts, they're going to lose all nutritional, well, not all, but they're going to lose a large part of nutritional value. So clipping... And then foiler feeding. The game changer for people out there, especially in the Midwest, especially in Wisconsin with our poor soil, is foiler feeding. Stop using the granular fertilizer and get on a liquid fertilizer program. Um, So on this, and we'll get into that a little bit more later, but clip it, wait 7 to 10 days, come back in, do a foiler fertilizer application to it, and roll with that just like that all through um, the summer. Now, come August, we're gonna we're gonna mow it again, but now we're mowing it tight to the ground. We're gonna mow that sucker right tight, and we're gonna come in with some sort of a fall brassica mix, and we're gonna intercede that right into what's already there. And we're going to let that grow, and that's going to be our winter attraction. There's going to still be some clover grow back. Grow back. You're going to have uh, the brassicas. I would recommend a mix of forage brassica and bald brassicas, and um, we're going to let that go. So what's going to happen? Have you guys ever seen a field of brassicas after the deer have been on it all winter, the next spring? What does it look like? It looks tilled. Yeah, yeah, right. There's nothing. They were There's, pawn. They were right. pawn at it all winter long. Yep. So not, not much of anything left. So did we have to till that? No, it's tilled for us. Nature tilled it for us. Now next spring, we have options. We can go many different directions with that plot because we allowed the deer to do the hard work for us. Um. I always say if you look at a food plot. And it looks beautiful, and it's the cleanest food plot you've ever seen, and it's 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 very poor nutrition value. I mean, we have we call it the weed tolerance level. What we call weeds. In order to have a healthy ecosystem, you got to you got to have an intermixing of different things growing. You can't have monocultures, and they got to be able to work together. It's all about a relationship between the things growing. So the situation he's in, it's, he's all set. I mean, he can work on that this summer as far as clipping and doing a little bit of uh, uh, liquid fertilizing, cut that tight to the ground, come in in the fall, intercede some brassicas in there. And, it, you know, the funny thing is, think of the work that I'm asking him to do versus the yeah, other work. right. When you learn how to food plot right, it's way less work and it's way way less expensive. The way that, that the industry is currently food plotting is way too much work and way too expensive for what it should be. We we shouldn't be we should be out scouting and we should be checking wind currents and we should be doing this and hanging stands and checking safety ropes and we shouldn't be out there spending a ton of time 
especially when we're doing more damage right. than good by doing it. So, <laughs> brassica. Okay. You said that there's uh, many different types yes. of brassica. Yep. And, and so, how do you determine which one do you go with off of your... Because you said you want more than just one... Yeah. A, a brassica either grows a bulb, a huge bulb, and it puts its energy into growing. You okay. think of your purple top turnips and your, your rutabaga. But there's also forage brassica, which they, they can still grow a bulb, but they put all of their um, energy and nutrients into what's above the ground. Okay. So it's forage. The other nice thing about forage brassica is that they can eat it and it grows back. It's gotcha. graze okay. tolerant. Yeah, it was they're going to graze on it. It's going to yep. grow back. It's yep. It was actually developed for that specific purpose for livestock to graze it. And then one one last question, just based yep. off of what you're just talking about, is uh, you, you're pretty adamant about liquid fertilizer versus oh yeah granule the granule yeah what what you know why what what's because I want to save difference? you money. Okay. That's why. Okay. So it's, it's money. God knows fertilizer is through the roof right now. Money. Right. Okay. Money, money's good. I like money. All okay. Right. So let's let's take a bag, um, and, and for simplicity, let's let's just use urea, which is pure nit- or nitrogen, nitrogen, um, forty six zero zero, and I buy a fifty pound bag of forty six zero zero, right. Okay, so that's 46 units of, of nitrogen that thank, I get. Thank you. you. You must have seen the blank stare on my <laughs> face. <laughs> so, number one, that that stuff was manufactured. It, okay. isn't, it, it wasn't that they went to the urea mine and, and, you know, magically come out in these little pellets and yeah. you're taking them. Sure. The other thing is, if I'm getting 46 units of nitrogen and it's a 50-pound bag, what are those other... Four units. Well, it's petroleum products, more than likely. Ooh. It's stuff we probably shouldn't be adding to our soil. Yeah, it doesn't sound like it. And that's a bag of 4600. Now let's look at a bag of 10, 10, 10. And now we're getting 30 units, and we've got 20 unspoken units. Sure. So, and let alone the cost. Somebody's got to get the material. they got to manufacture it. They've got to package it. they got to ship it across the country. They, all this stuff. Now you've got to go buy this 50-pound bag. And you've got to lug it around, take it to your broadcaster. You got to pour the fertilizer in there, and you've got to sweat and out there and and uh, spread this fertilizer. And more than likely, you've got sandier ground because it's the Midwest, and we get uh, inch and a half rainfall. And throughout the summer, we've got seven inches of rain, and all that fertilizer we spread on the ground is gone. It's leached through the soil. You might as well have been out there throwing hundred dollar bills on the ground. Yeah, it ain't gonna do yeah, me any good. Right. Or you do three or four liquid fertilizer applications. You grab a beer, you get in your ATV, you flip the sprayer on, and you put the uh, Midwest Racks and Rocks podca- <laughs> podcast on. And you there turn you on. go. I mean, your choice. You can do uh, either, <laughs> either one. I love it. All right. Um, what we're gonna do right now, guys, is we're gonna take a quick intermission, five minutes. And we're going to get back into talking to Aaron a little bit more about land management. We'll touch on a couple things. If you guys have any questions about food plots, if you have any questions for us, feel feel free to chime in at this time. And we'll get Aaron to answer those questions. I know I have a couple more questions. And then we're going to get a little bit more into the land management side of what he does. So we'll be back, guys, in five minutes.
All right, guys, we're back. Uh, thanks for sticking with us here. Um, we're talking with Aaron Begelke from Begelke Outdoors, and um, we left off talking about food plots, and then there was a few things I still wanted to, to touch on here. And um, this kind of goes back to a little bit about the, with that question that Chris had, as well as uh, a little bit of the, the 101, I guess, mm -hmm. if, if you will, of food plots. So I'm going to throw out a scenario here for you. Okay, and I think it's a very common one, especially you know, I, we've talked we've talked a little bit about some some things that uh, people who have you know done food plots before or are currently doing they might find beneficial. And we definitely want to go and take it to the next level on another episode for sure. But let's uh, go to one hundred and one, and let's say you got uh, a, some property, and um, whether you own it or lease it, and you have some. Barren land. Not, I wouldn't say, and no, I shouldn't say barren. That's actually not the right word. It, it's a lush um, field, open area. You'd be like, man, this would be a great spot to put, you know, maybe a two acre food plot or something yep. like that in, which isn't super huge. Um, but it, I've got all sorts of stuff growing in it. You know, where, where does a guy or gal begin with something like that? Um, I know when I first came in, I thought, okay, I got to. I got to remove all this. And we talked about how that's not necessarily a good idea, like just to kill everything and, and deep till it and just start with, you know, the, and I think that's the idea that a lot of people have is like, well, I just want like really fresh dirt and all right, now I'll take a soil sample. Oh, my pH is off right. the wall. I got to come in here with a dump truck full of lime. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. But why don't you maybe take us through a little bit about what, you would suggest to somebody in that situation? How, how sure. should they start anyways? Yeah. I mean, in the first thing we got to do is we got to verify what's growing there now. Um, a lot of the properties I go to, you end up with a, it's just a heavy grass um, field. Um, I personally like to wait. I like to manage that till the fall and then, intercede my brassicas and let the nature do its work. But, okay, we're in a situation where, you know what, I really want to get this going. Um, in a grass situation, you know, when I speak about the negative effects of herbicides, there are safer options out there. So there, it's kind of the gradual sliding ruler of harmfulness. Um, once glyphosate came to the market and... And the price, glyphosate, glyphosate, yep. Which is that's Roundup's active ingredient. Yeah. Once that come to the market and the generic version come and become cost effective, it was the easy, perfect kill all plan. But we forgot about what were we doing before then with chemicals that were not as harsh. Um, in a grass situation, you've got clethodim. Clethodum comes in a number of names now. You can buy it as a rest. You can buy it as arrow. There's different names of it. It's a grass-selective herbicide that's going to um, knock your grasses out. Now, you may have a few broad leaves in there. I prefer to take care of the broadleaf problem through clipping, through mowing. Broad leaves aren't like grasses. They don't like their heads cut off a lot. You know, once you start getting that down to the ground. Now we get into a uh, situation where we've got heavy broad leaf, um, and we need to, to burn that down. Um, then there's 2,4-D out there. 2,4-D, um, again, on the sliding scale of awfulness, is it's not as bad. So in a situation like that, uh, I would use uh, whatever selective herbicide is available for the specific weeds that are going there. And because we're not tilling the ground, we still need to get those seeds to germinate. So what I'm doing is I'm spreading my seeds first. Then I'm killing my whatever grass or broadleaf that there is. As that dies, it's going to create a carpet over top of them seeds them seeds will then generate and pop up through the weed mat that we've produced. Okay. Now, not only that, there's ground cover to help keep the moisture in, and you didn't disrupt the soil. Interesting. It just, it goes uh, completely against everything that I've ever done. 
<laughs> you and me both. Which is right. why I haven't been successful. 20 years yeah. ago, I'd have went and got a one-bottom plow. I'd have turned that field over. I'd have tilled it six, seven times till it was the most beautiful sandy beach you've ever seen. And I'd have had to take pictures, post them online about how beautiful my food plot was. And I'd have probably grown the most beautiful, horrible, nutrient-dense food that I've ever grown in my life. Right. So... Luke, if you could pull up a couple of those pictures there of, of some of that. So what are we looking at here? Okay, this is uh, one of our test plots. Uh, this specific forage right here, um, that is the GRO Forage Brassica. Um, that goes back to the Forage Brassica we were talking about. It was, it's multi-grazed. The animals can eat it. Um, I'll tell you a quick little story on this. This is actually a four-acre food plot. Um, that I've got test strips in. Uh, the last day of bowl season this year, my wife sat in a stand that would have been on the southeast corner of this plot, and she had uh, 21 bucks enter into this four-acre uh, air, uh, area of fields here, and she was blown away that every single buck migrated to this speci specific section of the food plot and stayed in here through the duration of the evening. Okay. Wow. Um, totally, you know, we learn by failure, uh, and we learn by doing stuff wrong. And right next to this is another plot of normal brassicas that I granularly fertilized. Do you have any? Did you send me any of those pictures? Why don't you click to another one? Probably not, because if you go back one, it, you can kind of see it to the right okay. there. Okay. All right. Sure. Um, and the deer were walking, and n now you can see those are a, a foot taller than the ones that are directly in the frame. Yeah. Okay. The deer were walking right through them to get to these. This uh, forage here was liquid fertilized twice. Okay, and the one to the right? Was granular fertilizer. Granular. Yep. Okay. So there's there's a lot of testing involved here then. It, like, there is a ton of testing. This specific forage that you're looking at right now, uh, John originally brought uh, it into the U.S., um, imported it four years ago. We've been testing it for three, and we just brought it to the market this year. Um, that long? Yes. Oh, yeah. The, one thing I learned about John is he will not – sell something without having real world experience and testing it and putting it through stresses. Wow. That's impressive. This is a plot of four galore. Uh, that's in my test plot in New Lisbon. Uh, that's a mix of lab lab cowpeas and two forage soybeans. Um, this was actually a picture that was taken. Then I liquid fertilized this one and I Probably messed up. I didn't send you the next picture, but the next picture, everything was a deep green color that showed, uh, and, it, and it was the next morning. The other advantage to the liquid fertilizers is instead of having to wait for that nutrient to migrate in the soil and find its way to somehow be taken to the roots to be absorbed, you're, you're putting the nutrients directly to the plant. And within four hours, that plant is absorbing those nutrients and using them. Okay. It's real time. Sure. Uh, this was a measurement that I did. Um, this was a farmer's uh, bean field right next to one of my uh, test plots. Um, I, I, I thought I was going to get more. I only had two inches higher growth than the normal egg growth that he had. Um, I was a little bit bummed that I didn't kick his butt a little bit more, <laughs> but I then so I sent in the forage anal analysis and the forage anal analysis on my beans versus these beans. It wasn't even in the same time zone. Way way more nutrients in your way more nutrient dense. I believe the bricks was almost four percent higher, which would be the sugar content. Sure. And this is just some more strips that we're doing. Uh, I believe we did a couple of uh, uh, a soil builder blend, which is a mix of um, fast growing uh, summer warm season crops that we use for then turn down uh, in interceding fall blends in the winter. So as you can see, we're, you know, we're 
we're not spending our time and our money on on a lot of TV ads and this and that. Mm-hmm. Our our stuff goes into research, and we we have no dream of being you know the most bought uh, food plot seed in the country or having seed within ten miles of every living person on Earth or whatever. Yeah, our dream is there's a certain amount of the population that that really wants to succeed in their food plotting. And we want to be the go-to when it comes to the education. One of the things I always tell people is when you buy food plot seed from a company with a lot of companies, that's where your relationship ends with that company. Their relationship started with their marketing and trying to get you to buy their product. You bought the product. Okay. Game over. That's the end of it. Yeah. When you buy our seed, that's the start of the relationship. If you call Grandpa Ray's, John answers the phone. Oh. I mean, there's no there's no secretary, there's no switchboard, there's no I mean, you're getting right to John or I. And he's probably not in the office. He's probably oh, out in the I field. I guarantee you he's not in the <laughs> office. Um He's picking up his cell phone out in one of those test plots. <laughs> right. Yep. And and we're constantly I mean, we're there's a part of it that we're trying to fail because a lot of the times our phones ringing it's because there's an issue that something happened. We want to be able to tell them what happened because okay. we've been through it and we found the solution. Yeah, then. Sure. Um, all good stuff. And boy, we could go on and on and on with this. Um, but let's, again, let's bring it back here to, all right. So we talked about the first step there. Um, what would, for people who are looking um, what recommendations, I guess, would you have for somebody for spring plantings? And then how would you, um, transition that to a, a, a fall planting? Then? Sure. Sure. Absolutely. Um, again, our, our goal is, is to have ground cover all the time and living roots as much as we can. So there's multiple warm season options, um, that are out there that, you know, I, I'm hoping you frost seeded. If not, we can be drilling in whatever we have to do to get it in there. Um, uh, cl- we're really, I mean, Clover, alfal- clovers, clovers, a big one. alfalfa is number one. I mean, alfalfa yeah. is very hard to beat. Unfortunately, alfalfa is also not as easy. You you, you got to work with that a little bit. Uh, well, for my own benefit here, uh, yep. because. Um, our leases have uh, two alfalfa fields. Yep, and that that I don't have anything to do with. Mm-hmm. You know, um, they for for years and years and years it was uh, it was a rotation between corn and soybeans. Yep. Okay. Um, our landowner, one of the um, one of the the fields is right alongside of his house. Okay, and he was getting sick and tired of the corn standing up until the end of November. And all of the mess from the corn, oh, all man. the all the the husk and that blowing in, because yep. his house was to the east, so everything blew into his yard and that, and he got sick of it. So he kicked that farmer out, and that, and brought another farmer in, and he's like, "I'm just gonna do straight up alfalfa," and that he's like, "Hey, great, you know." And at first, I was like, "Well, alfalfa for one, um, it's great for early season," and that. What we have come to find now, um, or how many years would you say it's been now since it's changed? Maybe, maybe I was four, say four, maybe four years that come gun season, our, our, our property becomes very vacant. Um, there's corn across the highway mm-hmm. from us, um, further to the east, uh, even further to the west, you know, because they're getting off. They're, they're, they're transitioning off of the, that, right. the greens and moving more towards the grain. So gun season is brutal. Like sure. we, it, is, it is just absolutely, our property is plummeted. Early season, I can sit out there in, in uh, late September, early October, and I could be out there at from 2 o'clock in the afternoon, one thirty in the afternoon, and, and watch deer right. all day, you know. Um, now in this particular alfalfa field, it's not ours on the backside sure. where, where, where I hunt. So I, I, I actually can't, I, well, I shouldn't say that I, I got permission from that landowner 
because I, I said it was so tough. I'm like, I'm not asking to shoot out in the middle of your field. I'm not asking to shoot my rifle out in the middle of your field during gun season. I'm like, but during archery season, you know, can I have 25 right. yards, you know, and that. And after a little ham and hawing, he's like, yeah, okay, great. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a game changer, really. I mean, because oh, yeah. whatever, fine, no rifles. I get it. You don't want me shooting out in the middle of your, middle of your field? Fine, no problem. But it, that's actually really been a game changer. Um, not that I shot my buck this year, but because this was the first year that I actually new owner bought this field, whatever. But honestly, it's funny. By the end of October, like it's it's dead out there. Sure. I mean, during turkey season, holy cow! Like we go out there and um, we're sitting close to that field. You get the turkeys out there. There's nothing to see. Thirty deer out in that field. Like two weeks ago, sure, it's it's just crazy. And then Alfalfa where they just go brings come, them in. come gun season, right? And then come gun season, they're gone. So it's yep. like one of those things. And again, it's about preferred forage at that specific time and place. Right. Would you almost like suggest that us that that we do something along the lines of a corn or yeah? So how do you or, or something that, like how right? do you yeah like how you, do we, you got to? Have- it's going to be tough because what we can do on our property obviously is not going to be to the scale. Exactly. Of what the neighbor, you're, what the, not the neighbors necessarily, but what the neighbors farm fields have. Right. You're not going to be able to, okay, corn and beans. There are certain situations that I would implement corn and beans into a management plan for a customer, but they're very far and few between. Sure. Um, there are so many better options out there, so many better, so much better return on your investment. Um, very few people have the acreage to be successful with a corn plot. Um, now, depending on deer density, if you're in a super low deer density area, or you not. want to put the money into the inputs. And um, I, I call it ice cream. You know, there again. The nutrient density is not real high, and mm-hmm. are you getting your bang for your buck back? The nutrient co- is not high in what? In the corn. In the corn. G- going back to our previous conversation about how agriculture has. So do you want your buck that you're chasing to go feed, fill his stomach on a cornfield that of uh, just this big ball of starch and very right. little nutrient density or do we look at this from another angle and say we need to outcompete them with a more palatable and nutritious crop on our property? And that's going to be more palatable at that time? Because I guess the, the, the school of thought yep. for most is that, well, it's just that transition that deer make. They want, they're, they're, they're going to the corn yep. uh, because they're bulking up, you know, with the rut going on. Um, but... Is that a falsehood? Is well, that a what fallacy? is ha- what is happening is in that area. That's the most nutritious and palatable. Because the alfalfa is right. pretty much done. It has put all its nutrients back. So if nobody else, if alive. you're not surround, if if you don't they're have the food plots, if you're yep. you're you know they're gonna f- try to find the good nutrient yep. rich um, food plots, and if they don't have that, then they're gonna go to the corn. Yep, exactly. Because the alfalfa is done. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I 100% believe that. Um, I've got I've got landowners that are so stuck on the corn and beans that I do plant them for them. Um, but they are learning as we're developing other areas of the farm that, you know, as deer evolve, as we evolve our food plotting skills, as we start planting competitive and more nutrient-dense food, that and I tell you, it's a hell of a lot easier to shoot a, a a nice buck off a forage brassica field than it is in the middle of a cornfield. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, right. So if they're I'm, not they're not hidden in the corn, right? So, um, that's what you're saying is a forage brassica. Well, that would be one option. Um, you may be in another area that you know a cold tolerant clover. You know, we we always talk clovers, but clover is a very general term for a wide spectrum of plants. Yeah. 
Um, you can have your annual clovers, your blondes. Uh, uh, you can have your the one that ends up in my <laughs> ends up in my yard. Yeah, I mean, you get your whites, your leninos, your reds, your elsite. You got all of that. They've all got their specific benefits. Um, you know, Aberlastings. I mean, it's probably one of the best clovers that are out there. Um, so clover is kind of a general term, um, but there's lots of options there. Right now, if I had to pick something, it would be forage brassica, hand down. But for fall, for fall. But okay. it, are we are we currently experimenting some other stuff that might be <laughs> as competitive if Maybe. not better? Absolutely, Maybe. you know. So yeah, and, and deer deer think with with their stomachs. I mean, it, yeah. just like you you and I driving down Main Street, and it's like oh, there's a Taco Bell. Uh, oh, there's a Twin Peaks. I'm going to Twin Peaks. I'm not going to friggin' Taco Bell, right? Right, right. Well, that's the way the deer are. Oh, there's an alfalfa field. Boy, that was good, like, uh, last month. Oh, sure. hey, look, Hooters. Let's go to Hooters. You know, they're... they're <laughs> Let's all go to Hooters. You know, it, it, it's, it's, to- to that. <laughs> it's totally... It, it, it's all about the, the palatability. So, sure. just, you know, not to totally shift gears, but just... A little bit ago, you brought up a management plan. Yep. So you don't you don't just sell a customer's seed. Correct. What else do you offer them? Then? Correct. Um, full service, basically. I mean, John's he's out across the country. Um, he's always out on property tours, doing complete management write ups. Um, I can come into into the properties and help with the food plot layouts and. You know, travel corridors, water holes, stuff like that. Um, and, you know, it, it's a relationship. You, you can't plant a food plot and think that that's a one and done. And I just, it, you got to evolve your property. Yeah. Um, you're, you're, you're evolving the property with bedding, with uh, cool season mixes, warm season mixes, travel corridors, feathered edges. All of that stuff goes together then to create that habitat. Sure, and and that's it's a good transition into uh, the next topic. I, I kind of want to touch on segue, segue, if you will. Um, there's more to <laughs> perfect it is magical. Um, there's there's more to the uh, to land management than just planting food plots. Absolutely, and that and and for some people, uh, it's not an option. Whether it be cost, because we just talked about how expensive yep. fertilizer is. And actually, let me just backtrack real quick. Let's take the fertilizer out of the subject. Let's say somebody wants to do something on a super, their their budget is tight. You know, hunting, we, we all know, can be, uh, it can be a poor man's sport. It can be a rich man's sport um, or a way of life. And let's say there's somebody that, you know, their money is tied up in, in all sorts of other things and they can't really what is something a guy or a gal can do on their property to create some sort of small food plot kill plot something that isn't going to they don't have to bring in a dump truck full of sure. lime or anything like that to change the ph levels maybe they need need to tweak it a little bit but i'm not saying that you're going to get the greatest results but what is something on the very very basic level in terms of food plots, that that somebody like, all right, I want to dabble in it. I, I'll probably evolve it. I don't have the money right now, but I want to do something. What sure. could, what is something they can I, do the, in, the in terms of food plot? Not we'll get into the other land management yep. stuff, but just food plot wise, right? Or kill plot. Um, I mean, we have a uh, we have a mix called Inner Sanctum. It's a throw and go. Um, grows very well in shady areas. Very limited. Um, need to, you know, rake the, rake the leaves off, maybe. You wouldn't even have to um, drag a branch over the top of it. That uh, is actually one of our most popular mixes because we found that the guys that were planting it have now actually moved it into large-scale plots because of the attractability of it. And, and again, what, is, what is it? It's Inner Sanctum, the name's a, name of it. Okay. And it's a mix of uh, shade tolerant grains and clover. All right, shade tolerant. Yep, right. shade. Because that's cause a big, that, yeah, that's 100%. a big thing. Because some, some guys, all they have is a big plot or, or a small plot of just hardwoods. Yep. And they we, don't have anything 
with a lot of sunlight shining Yeah, there's a little it. opening and they want to do something. Um, first thing I do when I get on a property is, you know, what 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 is your goals here? What do you got? I was on a property this morning in the, in the Wisconsin Dells area that we were looking at some of his food plots and he's like, boy, I'd really like to plant this here. And I'm like, well, I'd love to sell you that really expensive bag of seed, but it's not going to be successful. It's going to work. So let me sell you this bag of seed that costs half the money that I know is going to be successful for you so that you're happy. Um, and then explained, you know, why the challenges in that specific location were what they were. Yeah. Um, a lot of times, you know, we've got the hills over by Elroy, um, and I'll plant hillside plots where the top edge is shaded and the bottom gets a lot of sunlight. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll split that up, and I'll do a shade taller mix on top and a, um, a a more nutritious one that needs the sunlight on the bottom uh, as far as from a food plot perspective. But don't don't try and overcompensate for what you can grow. Sometimes you got to – something that isn't as nutrient-dense but it grows is way better than a seed that would have been nutrient-dense and didn't grow. That makes sense. Okay. Uh, like, for example, on one of our leases, we have uh, a, a strip that runs east and west yep. right through our property. It's power lines. Yep. Uh, or it was power lines. Was, now the power sure. lines yeah. gone. Now that they buried them through there. And it's about 20 yards wide, and it runs east and west. Uh, it's 140 acres. So it, it, it runs a long way. Sure, sure. <laughs> and that. And uh, the landowner uh likes to in the off season he likes to drive his four-wheeler around our land which, which is that's a whole nother that's that's a different <laughs> that's a whole nother story uh i guess i'd rather have him run around on the four-wheeler from time to time than than walking it all the time sure. and that it's it's less uh disrupted to the deer but it does cause an issue but what are you going to do when you lease the land um not to get into the whole thing but when you lease land you're kind of at the mercy uh i i know i've had people say to me well you lease the land, blah, blah, blah. You should be able to do whatever you want. At the end of the day, uh, the landowner can say, well, the lease is done next year. Mm-hmm. You know, like, I'm go- this is what I'm going to do. And he's going to be able to find somebody else that's going to be okay with right. <laughs> with doing whatever, right. the, you know, whatever he uh, wants to do. So you suck it up and deal with you it. You just suck it up and deal with it. Right. I mean, we're in central Wisconsin. Um, the soil level kind of sucks. I mean, the soil kind of sucks. It's sandy. Yeah. And that it's not this nutrient rich southeastern Wisconsin soil that we have where we're at here, and that. But anyways, um, like I said, we got this powered line that goes through, and I'm like, man, even if the four wheeler drives over in that, I'm like, I was telling my buddy, I'm like, I, I feel like we should be playing some stuff, some even if it's like very minimal, like some sort of throw and grow, yeah, like it gets a lot of sunlight. It's a big valley that goes through. I mean, is that something that you, you would suggest? I mean, Absolutely. not like on on those kind of paths. Even if it gets high traffic, there's stuff you can put, right? Yeah, that, we that, actually that's have, tolerant to high traffic. We have a blend that's called logging roads that's specifically sure, yeah. for that situation. Yeah. Again, on the nutrient scale, it ticks down a little bit. Yeah. But it does allow for some shade, and it does allow for the track traffic to be on it. And it still grows. Now this is this is this gets a lot of sunlight. Okay. And that well, it does, but it gets the traffic and that's right. So the other thing is he on the same path all the time. I mean No, I mean he's not out there every day or anything. But when he drives through it, is it pretty much the same spot? Yeah. Well then plant whatever you want and he'll have two ruts in it and who cares? Sure. You know, you could you could take Yeah, because it's yeah, there's plenty of space on the side. Absolutely. Now would you suggest like mowing that that stuff that that taller grass along the side of it? Yeah, in that situation I'd I'd go back to what we were talking about before again, where you know, depending on how tall we're talking, if it isn't super tall and we can just, you know, broadcast a seed into it and spray it with some clothodum and walk away and be done, great. Yeah. If there's a lot of thatch on the ground. We know that seed's going to struggle to get down there a little bit. We may need to brush hog it down a little bit and see what we're there. And if we got to do a little bit of minimum tillage, you know, we, we do it. And But sure, every ounce of ground should be used for, for something, whether it be warm season bedding, um, cool season bedding, or food. There should be something there. 
Um, well, and, touch on that a little bit, the cool season and warm season sure. bedding. Sure. Uh, you know, a lot of times it gets really cold out and people are like, uh, oh, a whole, I wonder how the deer are doing. It's negative 20 or or it's 110 and we're like, oh, geez, I wonder how the deer are doing. It's, you know, they're, they're, dying they're, they're, they're dying. They're dying. They're dying. Of heat <laughs> deer have absolutely no issues with, 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 with hot and cold. Right. Um, what they can't deal with is wet. Because as soon as you add wet to the equation, it throws everything out the window. They can't regulate that temperature anymore. So when you're saying wet, you mean like just like rainy swamp season? Swamp land. Or just um, being in swamp land. Yeah, I mean swamp land, rainy season, snow. Without being able to escape that. Without having an area that they can specifically go to yeah, yeah. that is created to allow them to cool down naturally or warm up naturally. Sure. Whether it be with some thermal cover uh, – Thermal cover that allows them to um, regain some of that heat throughout the the night and the winter, or some cool season native grasses that allows them to get in, still get that breeze through the grass, have a little bit of shade and, and protection. You know, switchgrass is the big thing that you know everyone jumped on the switchgrass market, and mm-hmm. um, there is definitely a a time and place for switchgrass. I don't consider it bedding myself it's just it's too thick uh, maybe does i mean you, you're still looking at a situation where you're not allowing for airflow yeah. and, and if there's no airflow how good is that deer's nose gonna work right it's and if all that, about that if that deer's nose ain't working are they really comfortable being yeah, in there, there. Yeah. now take that same area and plant a a mix of big blue little blue uh, some switchgrass in with it, uh, some Indian grass, some side oats grama, and all of a sudden you've created this tiered system that the deer can go in. They still have that height protection. The breeze is going through there. They feel that, okay, I can look here. I can smell what's coming here, and mm-hmm. um, it's just a much better scenario. And, and uh, we, we use a lot of that. We, we use a lot of berming. Um, where I live, it's wet. It's wet almost all year long there's there's water so my challenge is creating that bedding that's raised up that allows the deer to get to a dry location and have the cover and the comfort i mean yeah they can go lay down in the middle of a red osier dog dogwood marsh but they're going to be wet i yeah. need dry bedding makes sense yeah it, it really does did you have a question before i get into the next thing <sighs> No, I did, but he already answered it. <laughs> He's been doing pretty Brassica. Good. Yeah. <laughs> Brassica, Brassica is the answer. Brassica. Um, all right. So we talked about food plots. We talked about food and that. Let's, uh, before we wrap this show up, let's touch a little bit about what else mm-hmm. is involved in land management. So let's take uh, my piece, for example. Okay. So we're talking about 100 um, and it's a it's a transition. I like it. Keep going, going with the free consultation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is yeah, well, absolutely. <laughs> I'm gonna take advantage. I gave the guy two beers here already. Like, <laughs> um, so, so we've, we've got, got pines. pines. Yep. I mean, you, you know, know, you know, what central is like it's, it's sandy, sandy soil. soil. Um, pines and oaks. Uh, that that's uh, those are the two big trees. Some cedars in there. Uh, we have a large uh, swamp, big kettle that runs around. Mm-hmm. And that, um, but the area that uh, we primarily hunt is on on the outsides of that. So it's pines, big swaths of pines, um, and then oak trees, and we got hills and valleys in there. And that, um, what kinds of th- well, let's not take my let's. I, I guess, guess you can go, go off of that one, but land manager, what, what are some of the things that, that people can do? Like, so one of the things that we did was put in a few water holes. Absolutely. We did the preformed ponds, yep. not like anything uh, like, like they're coming out with now. Now they're coming out with, with stuff that is specific for years. Right. These are like bought at Steins Gardens and yes. Gifts, uh, Fleet Farm and Ours. Yep. They're preformed koi fish ponds. They, um, they hold about 50 gallons mm-hmm. to 100 gallons, um, depending upon the, the size in that. And honestly, it's been a game changer. You put a camera, at least in terms of um, getting an idea of what is on the property 
in the hot summer months because the deer are frequenting that. You put a cell cam over that thing, and it's like, okay, all right, these are some of the bucks. At least we know they're going to be there. Whether they're going to be there um, come fall, that's a different story, but we know what's in the area, and it's great. I've literally had pictures day and night of bucks bedding down within a foot of that thing sleeping. Yeah. You know, nose down to the, the ground and then and head up and then down and, and that and, and box sparring right in front of me. I mean, it has been, it, I've loved, absolutely loved. I think it's one of the greatest things we've ever done in the property. Um, now, I also understand, though, um, that water holes, it's one thing. Deer can get a lot of hydration from a good food plot, too. Yes. 100%. So it's not the end all be all. Like if you have good nutrition and that, they don't, they don't need a ton of water. Like like we think they don't need it. Like we're sitting there sipping water, or sipping, right. you know, all day long. Um, all right, go, <laughs> go with that. Now, now it's time for a shameless plug. Okay. Um, back in the early two thousands, I actually embedded a product called Bucket. And it is a mineral that... I've used it. <laughs> it's a mineral that you add to your pond. Yeah, you, you make, make your, your water hole uh, a mineral site. Mineral I mean, site. that's really what it is. And I am 100% the property I was on this morning. Um, we're, I get to a location, and it, it was just so perfectly set up for a pond. It had a ridge that was coming down into a small valley into a food plot, and I'm like... Man, we got to put a pond here, and, and it's going to naturally fill all by itself. It's going to be no work. It's, it's just a perfect situation. Would that be one where you're actually putting, like, a large pond? Or are you talking about, like, like what I was talking yes. about? And I'll tell you a story. I started Buckade. I was big on the um, the ponds like you're doing. And now I'm hooked up with a company called Earthlines that create, to me, the best possible uh, water ponds that you could possibly find. They're uh, 250 gallons is the big mega pond, and it's got slanted edges. It's got a coating on it that's all natural. It, they're, they're just the perfect pond. So it's not – It's. I think I know what you're talking about. They can they're wrong, walk right? It. Yeah, yeah they, they can walk down it. Because that, that was actually the thing. thing. So when I years ago, I, I want to say we started doing this – Eight nine years ago, um, I wasn't really seeing it, but I, it was an episode of Driven yep. with Pat and Nicole, and it wasn't like this. But uh, Nicole was hunting over uh, a natural pond, and I don't, I'm sure you know which episode I'm talking about. She shot that giant buck yep. there, and then I was like, man, water, water, right? Now we got this big swamp there, but I'm like, it's it's so hard to get there, and it's also somewhat of a bedding area there it's too hard to get close um with the, the way it's the land is situated in the, the predominant wind i'm like we gotta we gotta find we gotta add water in some other areas where they're transitioning to get into the stop or, or maybe change direction you know move them a little bit closer so that they're going to pass by us to get there so i was like all right let's do kitty kitty pools yeah you know so we tried that for one season. Guess what? The deer uh, put it. it. <laughs> I know, and, I, and I'm like one of the guys like on all the pages when people start talking about because it's still fairly new. I mean, it's not it's not super new, but there's still guys that are just now discovering or, or wanting to ask about it. And people, oh yeah, you just, uh, just go to you know grocery store out, you know Walmart, get a kiddie pool. Great idea. Uh, but the deer will put their hoof right through the bottom of that thing, yeah. especially uh, yeah. in the springtime. It will not last the winter. Um, so, but those preformed ones, um, and I actually was somebody that had koi fish ponds in my yard in my old house years ago on that. One that I did liner and everything and waterfalls and the whole whole ball wax, but I also had a couple of the preformed ones. I'm like, those things are durable. Like, the deer can... Can walk down, and it's funny because even in dry seasons, where that water starts to go down to that that first level, they're stepping down. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've had a whole family of raccoons, you know, sure. had a picture where they're like all staring at the camera, like, "Hey, look at us! It's family swim night." And that those things are great. Have you done any? 
what you talk about that product. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. And so I was big into this, huge into this. Had my my same thing as you, containers of water, and and then I got onto the bandwagon of okay, I'm gonna go with more natural, and I'm gonna you dig ponds and do liners and all that stuff, and and. It was the worst thing I ever did. The liners? I get well. It, they actually, well, I couple of them were liner, couple of them weren't. I ended up with EHD outbreak this year, Central Wisconsin, Juno County, and really? I I lost the biggest buck on my property, and I lost a large percentage of my um, mature class deer. Jeez, and no kidding. I I to. I just want to go in and fill, and I still might. It just it's, made it's, my heart skip a beat. Yeah, it, it's on my radar to fill them ponds in. Now, here's the advantage of using the molded ponds, the earth blind or, or the koi pond or whatever. Yeah. The EHD in the blue tongue is a disease that's spread by the midges. And the the midge flies, yeah. Yep. They lay their eggs in the mud, and then they hatch out of the mud and bite the deer. Well, what happened on our properties, we had three consecutive really wet years. So the water was here, the midges laid their eggs, the water come up, they laid their eggs, the water come up, they laid their eggs, and then we had a dry year last year. And yeah, it ex- yeah. It exposed three years worth of midge eggs. And it wiped it, it was it was just it was just the saddest thing ever. My wife had this one specific buck that she's been chasing and shed hunting. She walks into this pine grove and I could just hear her scream and I'm like, that's where he went. Because we wondered where he went last year. And the HD got him. Um, right. So when you're using the the manufactured ponds, the mud flats aren't there. The flies aren't laying their eggs uh, in the mud around them. So to me, that's a much better way to go. Now you add the bucket to the situation, and now you've got that mineral source too. You know, you know, all the guys that are out there putting mineral out and, and one thing that actually got me started on buck aid was I'd see that the deer would hit them really hard, mi- minerals really hard, through about, yeah, if you're lucky, maybe the middle of uh, July. Yeah. And then all of a sudden the mineral usage dropped. Well, they're starting to get their nutrients from the plants they're eating and everything. Mm-hmm. And then in the fall, which is the exact time we need our mature bucks to be getting the supplementation, they're not on the minerals at all. And they're not eating because they're out chasing does. Right. The deer has to drink. Right. It'll die if it doesn't. Yep. So when we supplement our water and the deer have to drink, anything that we can do to get them into winter in better condition yeah. is going to be a ro- reward on our end coming out that they started in better condition. Sure. So it's and part of the bucket. whole, again, part of the whole program again. 365 day nutrition, whether it's coming as a a food plot, a mineral site, we're legal, uh, a water mineral, whatever we had to do, we just got to maximize that availability. Yeah. Um. So with the midge flies in that, you were you were seeing that in not in the preform ones no because the mud isn't there right because it's it's a container that holds the water sure you know now there are guys out there that are really good at putting these ponds in and they know the proper plants to plant and they give you know they give you a program that allows you to but a lot of us are going to spend the money for that and we're going to go out and buy a liner and do it ourselves and we're going to end up hurting ourselves more than we help so uh, one of the things I did is I, um, one year, got I, all the water I used in that pond, I went down to the lake mm-hmm. and that, and filled up, I literally <laughs> drug out five-gallon jugs and five-gallon pails with lids, one after another, after sure. another, and that, we drug them out there and filled with that. And the idea behind that was, A, it w- was an easy water source, easy Sure. Quick fill, and two, we're going to get microorganisms from that lake. Um, and what we ended up with is a shit ton of frogs, yeah, in that in these. Sure. And do you think that is enough to handle the, 
the midge flies. I mean, having all these tadpoles and frogs living in there, you know. That's kind of out of my comfort zone. I would say no. Be- I mean, because when a midge hatches, it doesn't hatch in the larval water state where the tadpoles be. I mean, they're, you know, I don't know. I mean, they could. I will tell you that I like what you're doing. Um, for me, number one, rainwater. I want to collect rainwater. Yeah. I want to use rainwater. Rainwater is the best, most nutritious thing that you can use to water your food plots, use to fill your water holes, whatever. From there, I go to a natural water source. From there, I go to a well. Last case scenario. City tap water. Yeah, <laughs> last case scenario, I'm going there. But All that um, chlorine and yeah, God knows what else. Exactly. Fluoride you know. and. But no, uh, water holes are implemented on almost every property that we're on in some factor or another. I get a lot of guys in southwestern uh, Wisconsin, our Oakwood area, like, oh, I don't need a water hole. I got this beautiful trout creek running through my yard. And I'm like, have you ever put a thermometer in your trout creek? And it will know why. It's well, more likely that water's running at 48 to 50 degrees. And if I'm a deer in September, and the temperature is starting to go down, and I still have, you know, I, I'm trying to get warm. I'm not going to drink that water and drop my core body temperature where I have to expend calories to get it off. One of the best shed tips that I can give a person is to have a black tub out there during shed season that the sun's shining on and, lick, and melting that ice. It can freeze at night, but it'll melt. And if you can get that water to warm up, it's more attractable than anything that you can think of. Deer have been eating snow yeah. to get their water, and you're offering liquid. Liquid. Right. It, it, it's an amazing uh, opportunity to draw deer in. Sure. I mean, to, like I said, to me, it's been a game changer. I don't, and unless I had an experience with EHD or something like that, and I don't expect it. Um, and it's not our only water source. Like you said, well, across the road oh, is, right, is a right. lake, for one, yep. and that, but it's very narrow. It's it's like 20, it's like, it's the road 20 yards, and it's like, so it's not exact, you know, they're maybe going down there at nighttime, they're not going down there during the day, but then we have a swamp, and as long as it's a not a completely dry season, there's water sure. there. But even with that there, this is on another part of the property, you know, like, in more of a travel corridor area where they don't have to go maybe necessarily out of their way. Now, certain do bucks bed near that, that, that big swamp? Absolutely, for 100%. sure. But do all the deer, and especially when you start getting closer to the rut, this is a way more convenient for them. This right. is their, this is where the does are running, so now all of a sudden you're getting the bucks there. So um, I, I personally, I suggest people do it. I want to put another one in. This year, in fact, the landowner is a little bit of a, a hoarder in that. <laughs> um, he just he just has stuff, and he's had this big, gigantic preformed one that's probably as big as, you know, all the way to the end of that table and wider. It's bigger than the one I have out there. I, I bet you that thing's probably like three hundred some gallons. And it's just been sitting there. And my my buddy who uh, on the team, Mike here, every time we walk past it because we stay on this property. Sure. Right? When are we going to ask him? Right. Because it's just sitting there. Like, when are we going to ask him if Doing we'll buy that. it off you? You know, here's, <laughs> here's a hundred bucks. Yeah. <laughs> it's just sitting there. But um, I think those are things that people overlook sometimes. It's like all about the food, which is absolutely. Now, again, with land management, what outside of the water hole, outside of the food plots, if you were to pick one more thing that you feel like could be crucial to managing your land to either uh, produce more deer or to bring the deer closer to you, what would you say that would be? Okay, uh, you asked two questions there, so okay. I'm going to answer right, both, both, two, both, which is great. Um, you want to bring more deer to your property, you have to create more underbrush. You have to have more cover for them that's usable. Um, and how do you do that? Uh, you know, there's so many opportunities out there. Uh, with public programs, you got the MFL programs, you got the EQIP programs, where you can not only get paid to make these improvements, they'll write the plan for you and 
Um, you can do a select cut. Uh, select cut to open up the, the understory. Let the sunlight hit the ground. Let that grow up. We just had um, that on ours. Uh, two years ago yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be it's crazy how how it's it's changed yep. and i mean it's in the pines yeah in that but that undergrowth is really starting and you can see already the traffic, the, yeah. the traffic that's going through there now you gotta have the cover and you've gotta have and, and i like to have non-connected cover i don't want an area that you know you take a, a hundred foot by a hundred foot bedding area and you get that boss doe come in there and fawn out. She's going to be very protective that hundred foot by hundred foot. Uh, hundred foot. Mm-hmm. Well, let's break that down into twenty five foot by twenty five foot twenty in four sections. She's got her little area to protect, but now we've got three other additional areas that allow um, deer to come into. Smart. So, it, it, for me, it's cover, 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 cover. Number one, native plantings if you can. If you can't, uh, chainsaw is one of the best tools that you can have there um, to create edges feathered edges that kind of stuff as far as attracting deer you gotta go with hemp rolls hemp rolls are i mean they're the bomb they're the the number one thing that we use in our programs um you, you talk about water holes are great for um uh getting an inventory your deer. inventory yeah when it comes to hemp roll we we do a lot of uh kid hunting at our place we have an organization that specializes in um, taking kids and all have an opportunity to go hunting, hunting. I love hemp ropes on my stand locations. The deer come in, they go broadside, they sit at the rope. It gives the kid an ample opportunity to get settled in. I can make sure everything's all right. Um, the hemp rope is an unbelievable tool, and the reason that it works is uh, deer communicate through scent. And you, you picture a dog. Number going, one. Yep. You go into a dog park, the first thing that dog's going to do is going to run to the fire hydrant, sniff. That dog now knows every dog that's been there. Yep. Deer are the same way. They enter into a into a, a, a plot. There's a hemp rope. They go over to that hemp rope, and they, they rub their orbital glands on it. They smell it. They're like, okay, Joe, Jack, Benny, they've been here this week. I know what's going on. Um, that's great. And, and I'll share one tip that people usually pay for <laughs> <laughs> all right guys get ready for it <laughs> um one of the one of the most exciting things you can do with the hemp ropes is you get some hemp ropes put them up on your property and you get your buddy to go get some hemp ropes and put them up on his property then about a, uh, a week before October, halloween you swap ropes yeah, I was just gonna say. And swab you them. just introduced a whole different age structure of bucks and a new dominant buck into the situation, and it will. You got, drive you got their heads spinning. Up. <laughs> and and that buck is not going to be very far away. Yeah. And he is going to be checking multiple times that rope to figure out Jeez, when the hell did this great. guy come, and and uh, when is he coming back? That's great. No, that's. I knew it the second you said that. I'm like, that's genius. That is genius. That is, that is, yeah, that's amazing. It's all about the, uh, I got the my head. I got my head spinning right now because now I'm thinking. Yeah. And, and, you know, I say hemp ropes. I like to use hemp ropes. Um, there, there's multiple products out on the market. I mean, some guys will use that extra natural vines. Natural vines, too. yep, all that stuff. Is the, there is there a particular... Like hemp rope, I mean, you got to make sure it's 100%, right? Yeah, you, you want, want synthetic. No, you want the sisal rope. The sisal. Yep, yeah, because that that's the pure rope with no no coating on it. Yeah. Um, and we do sell them already pre-done and ready to go. Ready to go, all right. Or you go down and you buy some rope and you tie it up. And what we do is we put a, sh- a shrink tube with a zip tie on the top, and then we'll put a shrink tube on the bottom, and then we'll bell it out. Yeah. The reason I prefer the hemp ropes over a vine, over... It probably absorbs more. It absorbs and it holds the scent in there a little longer. Sure. Yeah, that makes 100% sense. Yeah, Um. so, uh, yeah, I would, and and for the, uh, one of my... I mean, it's a communication site. It totally is, and I always tell people, it's like, you know, all the stuff I've thought of in my life, a, a flipping uh, hemp rope that doesn't make me any dang money because by the time I build them, put them together, I'm basically yeah. selling them for cost. <laughs> right. You know, right. why couldn't it have been something that was like a you know a million dollar idea? No, it's yeah. a ten cent idea, but it works, and because it works, um, we use it. So, and that's you sell it. 
or Grandpa Ray's? We both saw it. Okay, both you saw guys it. both saw it. Okay, you, you heard it here first. So where, you know, I think that's a good point. Uh, where can people reach you? Are you on social media? Is there yep, a website? Yep. Um, the website is www.buckade.com, and Buckade is B-U-C-K-A-D-E. Um, <laughs> and uh, we do have Facebook page. Uh, Bigelke Outdoor Enterprises, which I believe still actually searches Buckade too. And then Grandpa Ray's Outdoors has uh, the website, uh, GrandpaRayOutdoors.com, plus they're on social media also. Oh, that's great. Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I, th- I think after this uh, episode, people are really going to want to reach out to you. That's good. Yeah, and I think I think it would be great to have you back again because oh, we I, I feel like we just – Really, honestly, in almost two two hours here, we've kind of just scratched the surface, right. and we kind of did that one on one thing, and we take that to uh, you know a sophomore class for the next one, and kind of you know get into a little more detail, a little Absolutely. more a little more technical. Um, but I mean, this has been great. Um, I, I I wish we had. You could say, well, I don't. My bladder says I can't handle another <laughs> another, another neither another ten minutes. For but with that said, no, thanks again, Aaron, for, for uh, joining us here today, coming down here uh, from New Lisbon, Wisconsin. Um, it's, been, it's been great, and um, we look forward to having you back again for sure. So Love to have you back on. We need to have you Anything back. else that you want to plug or anything else? or No, thanks for having me, and, and maybe we can get you up to our next deer school that we have this fall. That would be you great. You guys could be a part of that and uh, kind of show the public the uh, education that we do real time, on the ground, boots on the soil, hands in the dirt. That sounds like a great idea. That sounds like a remote. Yeah. I think we're going to have to go remote for that one. Absolutely. Honey, I'm going to need a uh, allowance. And <laughs> we're going to get a hotel room. <laughs> and is that in, where is that that's, that's going to be a new list as well yeah. all right great all right guys thanks for tuning in to another episode of the midwest racks and rods outdoor show um we appreciate having you guys here on the sunday afternoon we look forward to the next episode stay tuned make sure you guys are checking us out on youtube we have been uploading a lot of our episodes previous episodes on to our youtube page it's kind of new to us and we want to start multi-streaming both here on facebook and youtube at the same time um so we'd like to see you guys come over to youtube and follow subscribe and hit that uh, like button hit that like button um until next time always Always outdoors. outdoors